All right, good morning. How's everybody today? I thought it was fall. I thought we were through with the high heat days, but, you know, it is what it is here in Texas, but we are in here, and it's good to see you, each and every one of you this morning as we gather for worship. Thank you so much for sharing with us this time. If you're visiting with us, we really do appreciate you uh, choosing to be here at First Frisco this morning. We hope that we are a blessing to you. We know that your presence is a blessing with us, so thank you very much. Make sure everyone registers their attendance. Uh, there are red pads here in the pews, and those of you online, I looked at the online at 9 o'clock. We had a lot of online people at 9 o'clock today, so I don't know what's in the weather out there. But a lot of people registered in at 9 o'clock. It was good to see their names as well. Uh, let me lift up some announcements for you this morning. Uh, I told them at the first service, a certain Romanian count said, I want your blood. <laughs> well, we've got a blood drive here. Carter Blood Care will be here next Sunday. They usually park in this usually park in the north parking lot. It seemed like last time they actually parked in the south lot, but you can't miss it. It's a big blue bus that says Carter Blood Care on it. Uh, if, you have, if you are able to donate, we, there, as always, it's a critical need for blood. Uh, if you're able to donate for next Sunday, they're here from early in the morning, like 8.30 till 2 in the afternoon. You can even go to lunch and come back. Uh, or sometime during the time. But there is a sign-up table here at the north door, or you can go online on the church website uh, and find the link and sign up there as well. But I hope you will consider donating blood next Sunday. Uh, confirmation, that is a very special time for our sixth graders to continue their journey in faith. And you see on the sign there that October the 1st, that's next Sunday, a uh, class at 10 o'clock, and there's a parent meeting at 1215. So we would encourage you, if you've got a sixth grader or if you are a sixth grader, to sign up and learn about confirmation or contact Andy McKinney. On October the 8th, I will be having what we call Coffee with the Pastor. It's something we've done over the years. It's a very casual, informal time between services. If you're new to this church, whether you're a visitor or a new member, uh, it's just a time of conversation to learn a little bit about First Frisco, to ask questions about First Frisco, and just share a brief fellowship time together. So we invite you. There's a sign-up for that also at the hospitality table out at the ministry fair, or just call me, email me, text me, or just show up, and that'd be fine as well. Very casual time. The ministry fair, you did notice that out there today, all the tables, it's a way for you to not only see what's going on, but to be involved in what's going on here at First Frisco. So there are many opportunities for you to plug in uh, and serve through your church. So if you didn't get a chance to do that before service, please stop by and look at it after service. Make sure you register your attendance. Uh, and our opening hymn this morning is number 88, Love Divine, All Love's Excelling. Let's stand as we sing together.
We come to a time where we're going to say the Nicene Creed. And uh, I want to just take a moment to talk a little bit about the Creed. I won't take long. Uh, we're usually in the Western church, we're usually more familiar with the Apostles' Creed. We like it because it's shorter and it flows. Let me tell you, though, the significance of the Nicene Creed, which was our first creed. The Nicene Creed was developed in 325 A.D. Think about that. That's 1,700 years ago. First ecumenical council at Nicaea. And the deal was is Emperor Constantine, a lot of people will um, challenge whether he was really a Christian at all. Emperor Constantine embraced the Christian faith. But it was at a time when Christians were divided over what they said about Jesus. And so Emperor Constantine says, this isn't going to work. I thought Christianity was going to unite the empire, and you're even more divided than I am about, about all this, or the rest of us are. And so Emperor Constantine of the Roman Empire convened the first ecumenical council. And he said, hey, you guys get in here and let's hash this out and decide what we believe and so if, if you listen to the Nicene Creed, it's different, and it kind of rules out anything but. And it sounds like, well, isn't that kind of redundant? They were trying to be very clear about especially who Jesus was, the second article of the Nicene Creed. So as we say this, I want you to hear this as something that unites all Christians everywhere, which is different than the Apostles' Creed. The Apostles' Creed is a Western creed. The Nicene Creed is a creed that's recognized by both East and West. And so, let's say what we believe together. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is visible and invisible. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of the Father, God from God. Okay, I'm, I'm gonna, the reason I'm reading these is because if, if I can't see them, you can't either. So, here we go the only begotten Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father, through Him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, He came down from heaven, was incarnate from the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in the one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen and amen. Uh, turn and share the love of Christ with someone around you. And children, come on down. Pastor Tracy has a word for you. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. It's good to see you. Come on down. Come on. Hi, sweetie. So today we are going to talk about a lady who traveled a really, really, really long way to go fill a jar, kind of similar to this, full of water. So back in the day that Jesus lived, they didn't have a sink where they could just turn on their water and get a drink of water or brush their teeth. They didn't have water in their house. They had to go walk a really long way to fill up these pitchers and then take it back to the house and share with all their household. So if you see the pitcher up there when y'all are in your pews later, you'll see a lady that's 
standing at a well similar to what we're talking about, okay? Now, that's not the actual woman that we're talking about in the story, but just a picture. But when this woman went to the well, she had two things to fill, right? She had her water pitcher to fill, but she also had this little tiny, what we're going to call her heart, okay? Her heart needed to be filled too. And at the well, she met Jesus, and she had a beautiful conversation with Jesus. And she got so excited about meeting Jesus. And it was like Jesus went, I love you, into the heart and said, I see you, into her heart. And her heart was the one that got so filled, that she got so excited about seeing Jesus and her heart being filled. You know what she did? She forgot her water pitcher. She left it behind she ran all the way back into town to tell everybody about Jesus. And she left her water pitcher there, but her heart was very, very full. Okay, so Jesus always fills our heart, and that's much, much more important than anything else we can get, right? All right, so let's pray. Dear God, thank you for filling our hearts with so much love. We have enough to share with everyone in town. We love you, and we thank you for the water. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, see you all next. Come, come Holy Spirit, and fill our hearts. Lord, your word says that apart from you, we can do nothing. But Lord, we ask you to come and to fill us. We invite you in to do the impossible, to do the impossible in us to do the impossible in our families, to do the impossible in our church, to do the impossible in our workplaces, in our schools, in our community, and beyond. Come, Holy Spirit. Lord, help us all to meet you at the well today. To meet you at the well as the woman met you at the well, and to know that you see us, to know that you see all of us, and yet you hold our gaze. You don't run away. You look at us with love and not contempt, and you say, give that to me. Let me take that from you so that I can fill you up with living water. Lord, help us to receive what you have to give to us today. Whether it's perhaps receiving your grace to taste the living water for the first time today. Perhaps it means having our open, eyes opened like the disciples to see the possible, to see the miracle that you want to do in the life of someone that we may feel is beyond your reach. Come, Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit, and fill our hearts. Lord, give us the grace to invite you in, because you won't force your way in. Come, Holy Spirit, and give us living water. Lord, I pray that you'll wrap your arms of love around every single person here today. Around every single person who's worshiping online today. Lord, there's always so much more going on in the lives of those around us than we have any idea. 
But you know, you see, and you're ready to give us living water. Lord, there are those who are suffering, or there, there are those who are grieving. There are many who have lost loved ones recently. Come, Holy Spirit, and bring healing. Hear us as we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
Jesus said, uh, I have come that you might have life and have life abundantly. Not just a little bit, a lot. Lavish. We've seen God's lavish love poured out on our church in some new and exciting ways this summer. It kind of began with our youth group. There's always good ministry going on, but when you see the Spirit begin to break in, it's, it's hard to miss. And so we've seen that Spirit take root in, with the evidence of transformed lives and excitement and new priorities. And so we're going to use the word lavish as sort of our theme for our stewardship emphasis. But stewardship is about all of our lives. It's not just about money. It's worship, grow, serve, give, go. But when we talk about lavish, uh, lavish, I'm not the source of lavish. You're not the source of lavish. The woman at the well was not the source of lavish. She could give because she had received. But when we're dry... And when we need, God doesn't just give us a little bit. It's not wasteful or thoughtless. It's all we need and more. That's, that's the heart of God. So we're going to have a series of videos over the next, today and the next two weeks. And uh, we're just going to talk about God's lavish love. Let's listen. So, so recognizing those gifts and, and understanding that my greatest investment, my greatest return on society is you know, the young adults that I produce uh, in my family uh, through God and, and sharing my blessings with them and, and seeing God's blessings through them. So that's, that's how I've received God's lavishness. Um, God has given me so many blessings in this life, and I'm so proud of myself for growing. And I'm so proud of myself for giving that to other people, too, because I feel like God has shown me so much love and grace, and He's given me so much forgiveness and opportunities to help other people grow and help myself grow. So throughout my life, I've been blessed with many opportunities, you know, financial, career, family, uh, educational, and uh, it's it's really easy to think that I've crafted this life for myself, but then when reflecting on it, it, it's obvious that God has given me all these opportunities and opened all these doors uh, that all I've had to do is walk through. So I think that one of the big things that we've seen recently in the last year is, of course, the uh, birth of our fourth baby. We've been blessed with a um, a little exclamation mark or a cherry on top, I would say. We were, uh, or I, I will admit, I was not open to, <laughs> to having another baby after going through COVID with three small kids. Um, that was something that was not in my, in my mind and uh, in our future. And um, that was something that God put on my heart and changed my heart. And it's been just full of joy and delight. And we've really just loved getting to enjoy her and, and everything that she's brought to our family. And I think for me, I've, I've really seen uh, God's lavish on, on our family personally, uh, just in the grace that he's shared with us this year. Uh, so our oldest son, actually just a few months ago, uh, made a profession of faith um, to uh, accept Jesus into his heart. And uh, I tell you what, if, if I'm looking at things where are demonstrations of God's uh, lavishness in our life, I, I really can't think of anything more than that. Um, God has been lavish with me, especially starting this summer. I was not feeling really close to him, and especially after this revive camp that I was at. 
this was a big deal for me. I met a lot of friends, got closer to God, and I ended up giving, reclaiming my faith. So we were talking about this a little bit, and um, I would say overall, just through his overwhelming presence through the years, we were thinking about our last decade of life and all the transitions that you go through in your 30s of moving, new job, um, starting a family, all of those things. And ultimately, the most lavish blessing has been planning us at First Frisco. And um, just through his timing with everything and planning us exactly in the right place at the right time for us to find a church family here. God has been so lavish to me and my family. Um, I honestly grew up in Southeast Texas and I would have never thought that I would end up here in Frisco, Texas, you know, today. Um, my husband was in the military and he blessed us with many years in the military. And then when he got out, God chose Frisco, Texas for us. We've been able to grow our family here and he's just continued to provide. He's provide, you know, material things, jobs, he's provided family, he's provided our beautiful children. And one of my very, very favorite verses is, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And I've felt like I have wanted and yearned to make sure that my treasure is in the right spot um, because my heart would always be there as well. There is no greater testimony than the testimony of God's people for kingdom building. So thank you all for those who have been contributing to our video series. And uh, good morning. It is so good to see you all here this morning. And now you can see me. Yay. <laughs> there we go. So there is a group of people who meet on Thursday mornings to talk about the upcoming scripture. And they are a lovely group of ladies, and they talk about this, the scripture that's going to be in the sermon. Well, last Thursday, I encountered these ladies, wonderful ladies, on their way out the door, and they say, oh, Pastor Tracy, we've got it all figured out. We hope you get it right. At least that's what I heard. So I have never been more intimidated. <laughs> about giving a sermon than I am right this minute. <laughs> but another plug for their, their Thursday morning group, if I do have it wrong, we just need to go to Mary Ann's class and we'll all get it right. <laughs> so today we are looking at the sermon, the story about the woman at the well. And this is part of our sermon series about where we meet Christ through the book of John. If you would, please stand as we read today's Holy Scripture together. From John chapter 4, verse 7 through 15. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into the town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, You are a Jew, and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. Sir, the woman said, You have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did also his sons and his livestock? Jesus answered, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. You may be seated. So the overarching question for us today, which vessel needs filling? Let us pray. Heavenly Father, in this time together, I pray that your spirit overflow, and that your words for each of our hearts linger 
and infuse our spirits and infuse all of our activities so that we may come back to you for the eternal source of water and give you the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. So this story is often referred to as the woman at the well. And as we move through the entirety of this encounter in Scripture, we discover a woman who is living with a man who is not her husband. And in fact, she has had five previous husbands. She most likely decided it was easier to go to a well further away from town and during a least desirable hour. She went at noon instead of in the evening when most people wouldn't be around. So there are indications in this story of judgment. But who is doing the judging? Is it her community? Is it herself? Or Jesus? Did the community come isolate her, or did she remove herself from onlookers, onlookers because their judgment was a, merely a reflection of her own. Certainly, Jesus was not there to amplify her isolated life, but rather to help her turn her life around and be reconciled to a God who sees her. Which vessel needed filling? Her water pitcher or a thirsty soul. No one knows what I'm going through. No one understands my pain. No one hears my whispers of loneliness. No one likes me. No one likes what I'm doing. People walk out of their way to avoid me. Which vessel? Human desperation wants to be seen, to be heard, to be forgiven and accepted. And often the veil of isolation is worn without anyone courageous enough to remove it. Spiritual vessels remain empty. I've felt this before. I've had guilt sour my stomach, make my heart race. I've either avoided the apology to someone else or to Christ, and I've dreaded the moment that I would have to confront the situation. Sometimes I just wanted to avoid everything and everyone and avoid the topic altogether. But a verse that brings me comfort during these moments is found in Genesis chapter 16, verses 13. This scripture provides yet one more name, one more Hebrew name that was given to God. El Roy. You are the God who sees me. See, Jesus knew that we would encounter this conflict within our soul and he addresses it frequently. There are several biblical testimonies where we recognize this theme of isolation. Those who had leprosy were set apart from nearby villages. The woman who had been bleeding for 12 years, she wanted to simply touch the hem of Jesus' robe because that condition she had been in had placed her on the fringes of society for 12 years. Even Zacchaeus, the tax collector, he knew to seek Jesus and he climbed a tree, a tree just for a glimpse of Jesus. He had been looked down upon by all of the people in town because of his profession and because that profession created more burden for people in town for his friends. Isolation was worn the same in each of these, with shame and guilt and a need to be seen. And each encounter with the Holy One, it healed their brokenness 
and reinstated them back into society. The bleeding woman, Zacchaeus, the leper, they had within their grasp a knowledge of the Messiah, and they sought Jesus, and in return, they were seen and brought out of isolation. And there's another example of isolation, and we read about it in the beginning, in the Garden of Eden. It was with shame that Adam and Eve hid when disgrace entered into their consciousness. They removed themselves from the society of God. They were left alone with guilt and shame and isolation until God walked among them. He called them and he clothed them. He clothed them, too, as a loving reminder that even though they messed up and even though there were going to be great consequences, he would still love them and provide for them. His presence would prevail over the isolation that they had brought upon themselves. So in today's scripture, with the woman at the well, we see a similar instance, a similar occasion as to what happened with Adam and Eve. As God was intentional to find his beloved creation, Jesus too makes the moment, makes the most of this moment when he's thirsty to truly see someone else's thirst. Here, Jesus crosses national, cultural, religious, societal, and sin barriers to befriend the lonely woman. Isolated by politics and nationalities. So in this encounter in the book of John, we see Jesus making his way back to Galilee. All of his healing, preaching, teaching in Judea at this time was garnering too much attention. And he needed to kind of get out from that observing eye of the Pharisees for a little while. So he traveled through Samaria. And Jews and Samaritans at that time were not friendly to one another for many religious and political reasons. And often people would go way out of their way to even avoid taking this path. And here Jesus had no hesitations. He and his disciples continued on up through Samaria. The disciples went even further to get food while Jesus took a rest at Jacob's well, clearly within the Samaritan borders. Jesus, a true Jew, traveled through Samaria and broke all of those political barriers. But this woman was also isolated by society and sin itself. Jesus meets the woman at noon, which is the hottest part of the day, and at a well that's much further from town. So typically, the women would come together as a group in the evening when it's cooler to gather water for their households. But this woman came to a time and a place where she wouldn't have to face anyone else. But why? Why would she keep herself away? It's possible her shameful lifestyle may have caused her to receive judgment from others. Or it may have caused her to avoid that judgment from others. But maybe she just judged her own guilt at having had five husbands and not married to the man that she was currently living with fairly negative cultural norms so she avoided conversations questions and any interactions she comes to the well a mile away the hottest part of the day alone to meet Jesus because Jesus saw her Jesus disregards all the norms of his proper place as a man as a Jew, and especially as a rabbi, to initiate this conversation with this lonely woman. Isolated from her own community, Jesus meets her in isolation. But there's also another barrier that we recognize that this woman is facing. 
She's also isolated by a false understanding of who the Messiah is. As Jesus engages us further into this conversation with this woman, we discover that she is also isolated from knowing the truth about the real Messiah. See, the, the Samaritans believed in God as they had once been part of the greater Hebrew family. But over time, distance, the acceptance of national gods and idols, they now lived in a very watered-down faith. They now had a Samaritan Bible, but it did not adopt anything beyond the Pentateuch. And the Pentateuch are those first five books of the Bible. We read in our cultural note that the Samaritan Bible contained only the Pentateuch. They worshiped the true God, but their failure to accept much of this revelation meant they knew little about him. The woman knew there would be a Messiah, but there was this barrier to understanding the full revelation of God, and this meant that they would not recognize the true Messiah when he came. Scripture tells us that of the woman, she says, I know that Messiah, called Christ, is coming, and when he comes, he will explain everything to us. If you think back to the bleeding woman, Zacchaeus, and the leper, they actively went looking for the Messiah. But this woman at the well has taken a much more passive approach, waiting for the Messiah to come to her because she didn't know the full scope of who he truly was. She was looking just for a teacher. And then when Jesus says, I am he, I am the Messiah, can you even fathom her reaction? Her reaction. As any other encounter with Jesus, this woman too would have been dramatically changed. William Barclay's commentaries of this say, of the woman that she was suddenly compelled to face herself and the looseness and immorality and total inadequacy of her life. He goes on to say there are two revelations in Christianity, the revelation of God and the revelation of ourselves. No man ever really sees himself until he sees himself in the presence of Christ and then he is appalled at the sight. Barclay says there's another way of putting it. Christianity begins with a sense of sin. It begins with a sudden realization that life as we are living it will not do. We awake to ourselves and we awake to our need of God. And then the story takes a dramatic turn. It changed the woman. It changed her story. She is now a woman on a mission of truth for herself and for others. Verses 28 through 29 of this continue. Then leaving her water jar, the woman went back to the town and said to the people, Come, see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Messiah? She left the physical clay pot empty, but the spiritual vessel was full. She was seen and redeemed into a new life. She received grace. She left isolation and headed towards a social setting. All of this because she had met the real Messiah. As we've been working our way through this series in John, we find encounters in all of these circumstances. And John stirs up in us a desire to meet Christ for ourselves. We meet him in creation. We meet him as we're searching for him. We meet him in grief. And we meet him in isolation. And he, a loving, beautiful God, he gives us those opportunities to know that he sees us. El Roy. 
Jesus wants us to know that he sees us and can change us, but he also wants us to see our sin and be redeemed from its hold on us. Which vessel will you encounter Christ and let him fill your spiritual vessel, or will you still allow a little separation to remain in place? Just enough distance from people, just enough distance from others, just enough distance from God. May we be blessed with an encounter with Christ when we're in isolation, even if it's our own making. Let us know the real Messiah, the real friend found in Jesus, and I invite you to stay Be seen, be heard, be redeemed in your life with the living water that only Jesus offers. Hear the good news. Jesus died on the cross while we were yet sinners to ensure that that living water would be available to all of us all the time. Let's fill our vessels with living water, never to thirst again. Amen. And now we sing 130. Yes, shepherd like a shepherd lead us. There we go. Yes.
It has been a good day so far, and I know it will continue to be a good day. Uh, I think Tracy had some family with her here today, so uh, make sure you welcome them as they come to share our worship service time. Am I on? Okay. I was talking about me, not the microphone, but that's all right. (laughs) Hey, but it is good. If you're a first-time visitor, thank you so much for being with us today. Make sure you stop by the ministry fair and find ways to plug in. I know we have our adult Bible studies that have already started. Tracy alluded to Marianne's Thursday morning study. I've got a study starting this Tuesday evening. You can sign up for all of that out there as well or online. And may God bless us this day. Let's hear and receive this benediction. Oh, God, we thank you for the living water that pours within us, that bubbles up and overflows. Help us when we are thirsty, oh God, to claim that water, not from our own source, but from you. And as we leave this place of worship today, oh God, let us, as we receive the living water, let us not contain it within ourselves, but share it with all that we encounter. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Thank you.